one month before we were supposed to go live for a major client project, our database expert quit. Leadership started talking about pausing the project. We had a six person team, a 50 plus table database that nobody understood and a deadline that wasn't moving. Four days later, I had built something that not only saved the project, but now saves our team over 30 hours every single week. Before we keep going, quick shout out to today's sponsor, Firecrawl. If you've ever tried building anything that needs scraped or extract data from websites, you already know how painful it is. You fight rotating proxies and rate limits, and somehow you still end up blocked. You try to fix it, switch proxies, add delays, even randomize headers, and it still breaks the next day. It's a constant cat and mouse game. Now, that's where Firecrawl comes in. It's basically scraping, but cleaned up and automated. You give Firecrawl a URL and it returns structured, readable data or markdown ready to feed into your app or LLM. No proxies, no browser automation, just simply no headaches. Just clean, consistent data, whether you're building a crawler, an AI agent, SEO tool, MCP, or knowledge base. The best part, you can get started literally in minutes. Literally just an API key and a single endpoint. I've used it myself while testing AI agents that needed to pull fresh web data and it saved me hours of time. And they've got a free tier and it's honestly one of those tools that just works. So I highly recommend it. If you wanna start scraping smarter, not harder, go check out Firecrawl at firecrawl.dev. You need to understand how bad the situation really was. This was not that long ago. We had a small team, four developers, one tester, and one project manager working on a client project with a legacy Oracle database. 50 plus tables, no foreign keys, column names that made no sense. Classic legacy database. But here's the thing. We were dealing with it. It wasn't fun. It wasn't efficient, but we were managing. You know that state where something is frustrating, but like not frustrating enough to do something about it? That's where we were. I call it comfortable frustration. We'd spend an hour here trying to figure out which table had customer addresses, an hour there trying to understand how billing calculations worked, and we had a safety net if things didn't work out. We had a Dan. Well, I'm, I'm calling him Dan. That's not his real name, but Dan has been working with these databases for years. He knew all the quirks. He knew that table A actually joins the table C through this weird intermediate table that isn't documented anywhere. He knew that the column named num7 actually means processing status code, and then he knew all 47 status codes that could go into it. So when we needed to find something, we'd slack Dan. Hey, Dan, where's the customer contact information stored? He'd tell us. Or we'd say like, hey, Dan, how do we calculate late fees? He'd explain it. It worked. That process worked. Kind of. We were dependent on one person's tribal knowledge, but we didn't really think about it because we always had Dan there. And this is a pattern, right? This is a pattern that most teams run into. They have a Dan, someone who's been there forever, someone who knows all the weird stuff, and it feels fine until it's not fine, until you're exactly one resignation away from disaster, which is exactly where we were. We just didn't know it yet. So fast forward, Dan puts in his two-week notice. And normally, when someone leaves, it's fine. You do some knowledge transfer, you wish them good luck on their new journey, you might document some stuff, and you just bring someone else up to speed. But we didn't have time to do this. We had two weeks, and in exactly one month from right now, our project was supposed to go live. One month from having to deliver a production-ready system to a client, and we were in the testing phase, which means our tester is trying to verify that data is flowing correctly through the system. Our tester was trying to figure out that the calculations were right, that we're not just about to ship something that's about to blow up in production. And without Dan, we were stuck. Like, immediately stuck. Our tester would ask, well, how do I verify this like invoice total calculation? We'd spend three hours together trying to trace through the tables to try and figure something out. Or she'd ask like, where's the audit logs for customers? Who knows? We'd find maybe five tables that kind of look like it might work, but we weren't sure which one was actually right. Simple questions that we would ask Dan and he would have answered in five minutes is now taking us hours. Our daily standups were starting to sound like this. Like literally it'd be like, hey, what'd you work on yesterday? We'd be like, well, I spent two hours trying to figure out what table stores customer preferences. Did you figure it out? <laughs> Not really, kind of. We're on the right track though, you know? And it's a really confusing process. And here's the thing that made it so much worse. We were on a deadline. The client go live date wasn't moving. They had business commitments based on the date. 
marketing campaigns were already scheduled. They already had customer migrations planned. We couldn't just say, hey, we need like three more months because our database guy left. So after about a week of this, a week of watching the team just grind and grind against the database and not really making that much progress, leadership started talking about pausing the project. Really think about what that means. Six people watching our project about to be put on hold, not blocked on some technical challenge we needed to figure out, not blocked on the business operations. We're about to be stopped because we built a system where one person had all the knowledge on the database and that one person was now gone. And for me personally, it was kind of infuriating. Not at Dan, he he has every right to move on. But at the situation, like I'm a back-end engineer, I solve problems, I build systems, and I was sitting there unable to progress because I couldn't figure out some tables with names that didn't make sense, that didn't have foreign and primary keys. So I spent some time just staring at the table scheme. I was trying to figure out all the relationships between them, running queries to see like what data came back and hoping I was just going to be able to understand a little bit better at like what the designer was thinking when they were building it. I mean, this was a ridiculous process. And I was like, I have to be able to figure this out. And when I was doing that, something clicked. I was sitting there one afternoon staring at the database schema diagram with like 50 database tables open with lines written between them all trying to figure out the relationships. And I thought, I can't understand this database right now 100%. But what if I didn't have to understand it? What if something else could? And look, I know what you're thinking. Oh, here comes the AI solution, Eric. And yeah, but stick with me because this isn't about AI being magic. This is about recognizing that some problems are actually perfect for AI to solve. And this is going to be like kind of a cool little story on how it worked. So here's what I realized. I can't hold the 50 plus tables and all the relationships and all their weird column names in my head. But an AI can and an AI can analyze that. What if instead of my teammates having to become database experts in this weird operation, they could just ask plain questions to an AI and get their answers, almost like they were at talking to Dan himself. They'd be able to say like, where's the customer address information stored? How do I verify invoices? Or what tables are involved to refund processes? And it would just tell them. So I started thinking and uh, started prototyping. This was day one. I had the database schema, not the data, just the structures, like the table, the columns, and maybe some of the relationships figured out. And I set up an MCP integration. So MCP stands for Model Context Protocol. It's basically like an API for the LLM or, you know, a way to give your AI structured access to different things. In this case, we give it structured access to our database schemas. LLMs were able to communicate directly to the database and we gave it permissions to use select statements only. I connected our Oracle database to Cloud Code so it runs locally and I tested it. I asked the Cloud Code, like, where's the customer email information stored? It analyzes the schema, finds a table, explains which columns matter, shows me the relationship with all the other tables. It wasn't perfect. The first version, a couple things wrong. It suggests the wrong table or, you know, maybe miss a relationship, but it was promising. It was way faster than me manually tracing through 50 plus tables. So I spent the rest of that day building out the prototype just to see if I could build something that actually works, something that the team could use. And by the end of the day, I had something pretty, it was rough. It was functional. You could ask it questions about the database and get, you know, reasonable answers. Now, here's the critical part. I needed to know if this would actually help the team or if I was just building something that only made sense to me. Like if it helps me, that's great. But if it can help the team, that's brilliant. That's amazing. So I did something strategic. I asked our tester if they could try it first. And the reason I picked her is simple. She was the most blocked right now. She used to slack Dan five, six, seven times a day for database questions because she's trying to make sure that the data coming back is correct. Developers at least had some kind of, you know, context when they were building the features. Our tester was verifying data flows based on data she's never seen before in a database that's hard to understand. If this tool could help her, it could help anyone. I showed her how to use it. Just ask questions like you were talking to Dan. She was skeptical, understandably, but she tries it. She asked, How do I verify that customer billing addresses are correct? The AI reads the schema, identifies four tables involved, explains the relationships, and shows which columns matter. Then explains that there's an audit table she should check as well. Who knew about the audit table? AI did. I'm watching her read through the response. She tries another question like, how do I trace refund calculations? It walks her through it, explains which stored procedures are involved. So now we're getting into stored procedures. We gave it full access and it shows her the database flow. She looks at me and says, (laughs) no, I remember her being like this is amazing. And that reaction was everything because she wasn't being polite. She 
wasn't humoring me. She was genuinely relieved because for the first time in two weeks, she could find answers to her own questions. Questions she used to require waiting for Dan, trying to remember what he said. Now she just asks the AI and got her answers. However, it was still a little bit wrong. So I spent the next two days making it production ready for the team. It runs completely locally. So we don't have to worry about like deployment or anything like that. We just sent the MD file to everyone on the team and they were able to connect their MCP to the MD file. Four days after I started, I announced it on Slack. I said like, hey team, I built something that might help with the database issues that we're running into. Just give it a try, see if it works for you. And this is where things get interesting because the impact was immediately obvious. The threat of pause was lifted. We weren't nervous about that anymore and the team could move again. But the real impact, this wasn't just going to save our project within a week. This was going to transform how our team operated. Within a week, everyone on the team was using it, not just occasionally, they were using it all the time. Questions that used to take an hour or more, either you had to find in the database or reach out to Dan, they were able to get responses immediately. And if you got Dan and it took five to 10 minutes for him to answer, this is still faster. Now, with any type of AI solution, you always want to make sure that you verify the response that you're getting, right? You don't want to just trust it completely, especially with database data, but it gives you one heck, one heck of a head start. And the project manager did the math. The rough estimate was saving about one hour per person per day. Six people. That's 30 hours every single week of savings. Not one time, every week ongoing. Almost the cost of an entire individual saved every week. Think about what that means. One week after deploying it, we've already saved 30 hours. Two weeks, 60 hours. One month, 120 hours. The return on investment was absurd. I spent four days building it. Within two weeks, we've already recouped more time than it took to build it. But here's what's even more important than just the numbers. The team's confidence changed, right? Like we're saving time but before we were slightly tentative. They'd avoid working on features that touched complex database logic because they knew it meant hours of grinding through the tables. Afterwards, we just built things. They'd hit a database question, ask the tool, get an answer, keep moving. The database went from this scary, unknowable thing to just another system we would work with. Remember that comfortable frustration I mentioned earlier? We didn't realize how much it was costing us overall. Not just in time, but in momentum, in confidence, in the kind of work we were willing to take on. Now, yeah, the project, we made the deadline, we, we shipped on time, but here's the main thing to take away from this. And this is the part that actually changed how I think about engineering. What I learned from those two weeks applies to every team I've ever been on, not just the ones with this database problem. The tool isn't even the most important part of the story because the story isn't really about AI. It's not about MCPs. It's not about Claude code or any specific tool. Those are just implementation details. This story is about developer experience. Most teams optimize for user experience, and that's right. You should. How many teams actually optimize for their own team, for their own developer experience, for their own team's velocity? We don't think about it because it feels like internal stuff, like overhead, like something you just deal with. But your team's velocity is your competitive advantage, especially if you're a smaller team or a smaller company or working on tight deadlines or trying to move faster than competitors. Your team velocity is everything. If your team is spending 30 hours a week grinding against problems that could be solved, that's just annoying. You're missing business impact. That's features you could have been shipping. That's bugs that you could have been fixing. That's innovation you're not doing. And here's the part that bothers me looking back. This could have been done six months earlier. Think about that. If I built this tool six months earlier, before Dan left, we could have saved 30 hours a week times 24 weeks, 720 hours, just gone, wasted on grinding through databases we didn't need to manually understand. Or we could have had Dan verifying the output of the AI. 720 hours, that's four and a half months of one person's full-time work. Features we could have shipped, innovation could have been done, but it's gone. That time is gone because we were comfortable being frustrated. But we didn't build it because the frustration was comfortable. It wasn't a crisis. It was just annoying. We'd complain about it. We'd say, yeah, this database is junk, but we lived with it. And that in itself is a dangerous pattern. Comfortable frustration. You know, something's inefficient, but it's not bad enough to prioritize fixing it until it becomes a crisis, until Dan quits, until leadership is ready to pull the plug on the project. Don't wait for your crisis moment. 
Look at your team's daily frustrations right now. The things people complain about in Slack, the things that make developers go, ugh, I have to deal with X again. Those are opportunities for you to make yourself better, your team better, your company better. Take advantage, and I'll see you in the next video.